everyone to Destination Cuisine, our summer 2022 series. We are so excited to be back up and sharing and joining us once again, good old chef Tamika R. Francis. She is taking us and starting off with episode one, and she's going to share all the secrets of making a perfect pan seared cake shark. So stay tuned. Make sure you follow her on Instagram, Food and Folklore, or her new uh, uh, um, account, Dutch Pot App. And make sure you all stay muted. Um, I'm sure we've been on Zoom enough. We know we need to stay on mute and use the chat if you need to. If you are experiencing any technical in, in, um, issues, remember you can switch over by hitting the little microphone in the lower left-hand corner and switch over the phone audio. Make sure you pair it with your participant ID and you will be back, um, back into the Zoom and clear as crystal clear. And then don't forget, you can use your reactions to raise your hands. We're gonna keep most of the questions to the end of this, um, but if there's anything relevant in the moment, just go ahead and share it in the chat as well. So I'm going to welcome our director, uh, Pat Spence, to say a few words. Hi everyone, it's Pat Spence from the Urban Farming Institute. We're here growing food as much as possible for our community. And if you look at my background, those are our marvelous mixed salad greens, which we are growing currently. And uh, we're basically here to support the development of more urban farmers and uh, certainly helping our community to understand how food can make a difference in their lives. Farm Stand opens July 15th, 1 to 4 p.m at our historic headquarters, 487 Norfolk Street in Mattapan. And again, we are so excited about the Destination Cuisine returning for a second year. And there's a wonderful lineup and we hope you join us again. And thank you to Mika and also thank you Linda and Angela for putting this all together for us. And I have to say a shout out to my friend Brian also. Hi Brian. Okay, <laughs> everybody have a good time tonight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And one other thing, one of my wrench now mission, U of I's mission is develop and promote urban farming to engage individuals in growing food and building a healthy community. And our sponsors, this would not have happened without any of our sponsors. And we'd love to thank all our special thanks to all of our sponsors who are helping us with this series. So right now I'm gonna turn it over to Linda and Linda's gonna introduce the uh, featured chef today, Tamika R. Francis. So I wanna do a second welcome. I'm, I'm Linda Palmer and I work at Urban Farming Institute. For those of you who joined us last season, welcome back. And for those who are new this year, we're happy to have you. And we're hoping that you will come back um, for the next two series um, in June, and then we'll have a fall series, but we'll tell you more about that as, as time goes on. So I wanna to introduce Tamika Francis. She is no stranger to Urban Farming Institute, and she's no stranger to Boston. She is a public health professional. She's a chef, she's a mom, um, and she is a person extraordinaire. Um, she's going to be preparing Cape Shark um, with chutney on a bed of lettuce. Um, and she's going to be doing a little bit of storytelling. So I'm going to stop talking right now. And I'm going to introduce you to Tamika R. Francis. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Angela. I'm always excited to do anything with or for UFI. In full disclosure, I am a board member with UFI. So I definitely hold the organization very close to my heart, um, especially with the work they do around farming. So Linda said, I'm Tamika, and I'm super excited about tonight to get this series started. Um, the recipes for tonight, we have two recipes going. We're super ambitious tonight, right? Um, I want to do a sorrel chutney. Um, I, you know, in the chat, perhaps those who um, are familiar with sorrel, maybe put in the chat what you know sorrel as. I'm trying to give you a peep of what it looks like. But sorrel is known by very many different names, depending on where you are from. There's a few names for it. Um, but we're going to do some sorrel chutney. 
I chose Sorrel on purpose. It's Juneteenth. I like to celebrate Juneteenth with food, with food, right? And food waves. So we know that Sorrel came from, or is known to be native in West Africa in the 15th and 16th century and came to the Caribbean and the West Indies and then through the South of America. And so Sorrel for me is super important. It's a hibiscus plant. And it's great um, for a holiday drink and chutney as, you know, various ways, jams, jellies, um, or just as a drink. We're going to do a Sorrel chutney tonight. And then we're gonna do the Cape Shark afterwards. And I wanna really talk about the Cape Shark because many people are like, wait, what's that, right? So let's start with our chutney. Um, one of the things I'd like to say, you will have a copy of the recipe. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm not a very good follower of a recipe, even the one I wrote, right? So I will be trying to follow through as much as possible, but feel free to definitely adjust um, based on your style, based on your needs. So let's start with our chutney, right? And I got mine started. We washed up the calluses of the sorrel plant. They're in here. I put my sugar in, um, my brown sugar, my pimento, my ginger, my garlic. Very warm in spices. A chutney essentially is a reduction of a fruit of some sort that has spices and fruits. It's sweet and savory at the same time. Most folks know mango chutney or pineapple chutney and accompaniment for fish. So we're doing a sorrel chutney um, tonight. So I got that started and um, that's here. And then the sorrels in here, I'm going to do some raisins, some lime juice, some vinegar, and some scotch bonnet pepper. Chef, is sorrel yeah. something that can be grown here? Is it a, is it a plant? Is it a, come from a tree? Where does it come from? Think of the hibiscus family, if you're familiar with hibiscus, the, the flower. So it's in the do same family. Yeah, so it's called Roselle or Zugo. It's called very different names, mostly in the West Indies or the West of Africa and also Latin America. And so it can be grown in the in Florida for sure. I've seen it growing in Florida. I mean, climate change is horrible. It also means that you're growing tropical plants um, in various parts of the U.S. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to highlight one of the spices I'm going to use in my chutney. I'm using pimento. Folks know this is allspice. And I definitely like to get these nice and whole from tropical foods in Boston or any of the Caribbean or Latin American um, places. I like to use a mortar and pestle kind of old school. You could also use a coffee grinder if you're into that. I like to go ahead and really release the oils in the pimento that goes into that chutney. So is this recipe native to Jamaica? You know what? That's a great question. I kind of pulled together these two things based on my, my own experience. Um, sorrel chutney, definitely. Chutney in particular is from the subcontinent of India. Um, Jamaica, Trinidad, and very many Caribbean islands have a distinct Indian connection. Um, so there's usually a East Indian connection in our food from our curries to our stews. So the idea of doing chutneys with spices came from that. Okay. Um, you can buy bottled or jarred chutney these days, um, but I like to make mine from scratch. So that's where that came from. Right. So to be fair, I put all my spices in. I have two stoves going, so my sauce is in the back. We're going to pull that later on so you can see the consistency. You're looking for a preserve consistency, so chunky fruit, but definitely your sugar has been reduced. The marker for knowing when it's ready is that if you still have syrupy sugar running along or, or liquidy sugar rather, it's not quite ready. You want that sticky, gooey, almost jammy. That's the best way to express or to share what you're looking for. So, so once you make it, how long will it last in the refrigerator? Yeah, so a chutney could last, a I mean, you could up to a week or two, I'd say unless you're following the processes for sterilization to like really do, you know, a mason jar, you're sterilizing your jar. I wouldn't go past a week or two, to be fair. Okay. Um, you want to have it in a nice, clean, airtight glass to be exact. That way it's safe in your refrigerator. Okay. If you sterilize it, um, do, you know, full-on sterilization and definitely do a, um, and lock it, then that could last, I mean, for several weeks or months. Yeah. All right, so we have our chutney going. Again, you may not see on your recipe a time per se because that chutney sugar and the acid in the fruit um, will definitely, you know, gel, so to speak, and then gets that gooey consistency. And you'll know when it's done based on how runny that process, um, that product is. So that's going in the back. 
And one of the things I want to highlight is I did add scotch bonnet or habanero peppers. These are super, super spicy. They're pretty much high on the Scoville scale. And I like to either put these in whole to extract the flavor from the skin or to de-seed or remove the seeds from them. So the seed is definitely where I'm going to grab my knife here. The seed is definitely where um, the spice comes from. If you're not familiar with pepper or it's just not your thing, I see you use gloves for this. You open a pepper up, you remove, you de-seed, remove the seeds on the inside, and then do fine chop. I'd say a whole pepper is a lot. You probably need probably a quarter or even an eighth of this to get some spice happening if you're not really a spicy um, food person. If you're looking for some, some heat, the entire thing goes in. So that's our scotch bread pepper. And quick plug, um, UFI does have this in the summer months. Really wonderful, beautiful scotch bread peppers are available at UFI at the farm stand. All right, Linda, can we move into our fish? Yes, tell us about the shark. All right, I'm super excited for this. So let me start by saying what I've done to it so far. What you're seeing here is two fillets of cape shark or dogfish. And what I've done with this is I bought it already cut. I washed it. It was soaked in an acid. So lemon juice or lime juice or buttermilk. And the reason I did that is because while well, fishermen definitely try and handle local seafood very well, sometimes um, it may have a rancid taste or an ammonia taste based on where it was handled or what fish it was handled with. So you want to remove that by adding an acid to kind of dilute that odor or that taste. So this was washed, soaked for about 30 minutes or so, and then packed dry on both sides. So I have two pieces of Cape Shark Filet. Now in the chat, if you can, have you seen Cape Shark Filet? Like what's this thing she's talking about, right? Cape Shark or Dogfish. So Cape Shark or Dogfish um, is a local alternative to cod. It's more sustainable. It's plentiful in the Cape of Cod, the Massachusetts area all the way in the Atlantic Ocean from as far up as Halifax or Nova Scotia and all the way down to the Caribbean. So for me being Jamaican, having lived in the Eastern Caribbean, this like is really like a homey meal for me because um, we do find dogfish or Cape shark in that area. It's mild, it's sweet, it's flaky. It's a white fish kind of like halibut or cod, but because it's so available, we won't overfish or, or sea or oceans. It replenishes very quickly. So what I'm doing to it as a pat dry, I'm doing a mixture of salt and pepper. I like to say, if you wanna invest in one thing in your kitchen, it's a pepper mill. Um, fresh cracked pepper can really make a difference in your food. And so I had salt and pepper. I also had all the spices that were on the recipe, a mixture of Old Bay seasoning, some classic American seafood spices. I had garlic powder in here, paprika, a little bit more salt and pepper. I made that seasoning mixture all together. And I'm gonna say generously, right? Very generously um, season that fish with that mixture. Chef, we may have some vegans or vegetarians or people yeah. who um, need to have no gluten. So what, what's an alternative for vegans or vegetarians or people who need gluten-free food? Well, this meal is definitely gluten-free in all its glory. I didn't do, you could have done a batter for this fish. I, I opted not to. There is another version of this recipe that's on um, a local WER. It has flour. Um, this one is pan seared, so there is no flour on here. I'd say if you're not eating animal protein, because this is, I mean, a fish is an animal, I'd say probably a tofu, a firm tofu could be treated the same way with this. Okay. I do the same thing where you'd press it, you'd remove extra liquid, and then you season it, you know, generously like the way I'm doing it, and then pan sear or bake it off. Um, it could also be cauliflower, right? Cauliflower, I think, is meaty Ooh. enough or substantial enough to, it won't taste fishy, if you really want to try and mimic the fishy or umami flavor, maybe you're adding like some soy or tamari sauce or something that has an like umami or even fish sauce. I'm going to wash my hand off camera, Linda, and I'll be right okay. back. Okay. What else do you have for us to put?
And I'm going to let someone in who's having, I'm trying to let someone in who's having some trouble. Sure. So I have my fish prepped. I went ahead and washed my hand. I mean, as usual, if you do handle animal protein of any sort, you're going to wash your hand. So I'm going to get started on this pan sear. Again, Cape Shark, the reason I like to use it um, for those who are familiar with the Caribbean or even the Cape, I mean, the Cape Cod or Massachusetts area, we love a fish and chips, right? This is a great alternative to, um, to cod that's being overfished and definitely can be lower in price because people are still not loving Cape Shark just yet. And I mean, the dogfish, so some folks are still confused as to why it's called dogfish, just the look of the animal. But um, definitely, if you do a stand by like side by side taste test, they're very, very well, um, very, very similar in taste. So there was a question um, sure. about where you can buy it. Yeah, so we aren't we lucky in New England? Like this time of year, there's so much seafood to be had. Um, I'll start by saying the North American Atlantic Marine Nama, which is our local like marine folks, they definitely like to push this. So I got this. Um, at Wolf's Fish in the sea, in, or in the downtown Boston, like the Harbor area. But I see if you go to Boston Public Market, there are a few fish vendors there. Um, some folks go direct day boat, as in they go to the Cape. That's going to be pretty hard. But I say anywhere you find fresh local fish, if it's not already available, I think the more consumers ask for it, the more you'll be able to find it. So it does take some work to ask by either dogfish or cake shark, which is like the commercial or marketing name for that. If you don't have it, I'd say use your cod or your halibut, but anything that's a firm white fish that flakes very beautifully. All right. So in terms of steps, I put my pan on to medium heat, a nice heavy bottom skillet. It's on to medium. I pour some oil in, some neutral. By neutral oil, I'd say probably avoid coconut, anything that has a nutty flavor. You don't want to introduce flavor into your white fish, right? So I'd say olive oil uh, perhaps would burn too quickly or heat too quickly. So let's have a regular vegetable, like one of the mill oil here. And that's what goes in. And the idea of searing is to really get some nice deep brown color on each side. Fish cooks pretty quickly at say around 10 minutes or so tops and that sits and that protein coagulates or becomes white and cooked all the way through. So I like to say start by giving a hard sear on the first side and a hard sear just means really hot oil. Fish goes in, stays there, don't move it, hands off for the first two minutes or so to get a nice beautiful crust and that dark golden color. So my oil is ready. I'm gonna put that in, I'm doing like this, like feeling the heat above. And if you're newer to cooking, you know, you're a little bit you know shy about oil, I'd say this is anti, like this is the opposite of what you probably think. The closer you go in, the better that is. So go in and face that fish down. Try to make the entire surface area of the fish have contact with that oil. I'm actually gonna turn my heat up a little more. And this is the part where you wait, right? And you wait, I'm gonna wash my hands again. I'm just gonna remind you if you have questions, put them in the chat. And you wanna resist the urge to check, right? You wanna resist the urge to see if it's ready, is it okay? Um, you know, there are no guarantees, but if that fish was packed dry, was seasoned well, that oil was heated, then once that fish goes in, it should give you a beautiful sear. Some folks tend to have fish sticking, that happens to the best of us. Um, but for the most part, once you have a really hot oil, hot pan, and then dry seasoned fish, you shouldn't have sticking. If you do, just adjust, and it will be, it'll be as delicious as if it was perfect, right? It'll be just as delicious. So back to Cape Shark. So again, um, it can be found locally. I think it's not as popular just yet. Um, it can be pan fried, seared, it can be grilled. And the reason I wanted to do this recipe is to offer a way to balance both, you know, Urban Farming Institute, lots of local produce, but also local animal protein, right? And try and balance that over the summer if you can. 
Okay, I think my camera is shy. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with my first piece that was up first. Please use your utensils. I'm using my hands because I use my hands. Um, that beautiful hard there, can you see that? Put my camera with that. So definitely very beautiful, dark brown. And then I'm gonna go take my second piece. Uh, that went a little bit too far, but you know, still gonna be delicious. So this is a good, like, a good teaching moment. My first piece was stared beautifully. So golden brown, a little bit of crisping. My second piece went a little bit too dark, but it's gonna be delicious anyway. So once that first piece is stared for two to three minutes, it cooks most of the protein. And your second piece now is really just the stare of the other side. And what I like to do is introduce some flavor, some aromatics. So I have some fresh thyme, whoa, some garlic. That goes right into the oil. And it adds some more flavor to our fish. Chef, some people, yeah. um, when they have fish like tuna, they may like it rare. Is this a fish that you could, you know, have different degrees of um, cooking? Rare, medium rare? Yeah, I think with most cod, you want to go, you want to cook all the way through. You want to get that internal temperature up for about one at least. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to, one moment, I'm going to take this stuff so we have one beautiful piece. Right, with a tuna, like a very high quality tuna, you can definitely mm -hmm. go rare because it's really high quality fish. I'd say for most other fish um, that's not intended to be had raw, you want to cook all the way through and to avoid, you know, potential for harm. Okay. Um, so I, again, perhaps check the sources as far as I know, anything in this family of cod or so needs to be cooked all the way through. So I'm going to rest my fish. Um, folks can see it. Definitely one piece of my fish went too far, but happens to the best of us. Um, and then, yeah, you want to go at least 10 minutes or so. So the two to three minutes on one side, and then definitely you want to baste it to get some flavor to it. And then we can uh, pull it. What was your other question, Linda? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right, while you're trying to remember, I'm going to check on our chef <laughs> over here. Now, can you marinate the fish overnight? Yeah, absolutely. So you could definitely marry it overnight. That will infuse some more flavor um, into the fish. I'd say I'd just be mindful of having it sit in liquid. Mm -hmm. So most likely, as I mean, I did a dry rub. As you saw, my spices were grounded dry spices. Um, if you're going to do it overnight, maybe how it sits on a rack. It doesn't sit in its own juices, but you've already packed dry. But I'd say okay. try and have it on a rack or a sheet and there's no like liquid underneath it. Okay. Yeah. So let's so you let's say you've used the chutney for the pan seared shark. Yes. What are the dishes can you use the chutney for? So the chutney can be used a few ways, right? I'm gonna sit this way here. I'm gonna pull the chutney over so we can work on that. The chutney can be used for a few things, right? Um definitely that sweet with the acid from the vinegar and the lime juice and the spices. It goes well with um meat, right? Usually it goes well with meat. If meat's not your thing, it could be great on a cheese platter. If you're doing like dried food, like a fig, imagine like replacing that for like a jam or jelly. So if you're doing like dried fruit or crackers or cheese or fresh food on a board, that chutney is really beautiful with it. Um, I like to then thin my chutney to make it into a dressing. It still has that beautiful red um, sorrel flavor. So with a little bit more vinegar, perhaps, or oil, you can make a sorrel vinaigrette from it. So chutney is almost like a base, a concentrate that could be then used for several other um, things. There's so many creative um, drinks these days, whether it's a mock oh, drink or whether it's yes. a cocktail. So could you possibly use the chutney in a cocktail or a mocktail? I like to, this is my favorite answer to give when I don't know. I do not know. 
I must okay. be making drinks is outside my expertise. <laughs> I imagine perhaps, but I, I'd be able to be fair with you. It's outside my expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone in the chat has more information on that than I do. If I make you a drink, you tell me, no, thank you. I'm hard about making drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I am as well. <laughs> okay. So I pull my sorrow bike, my chuck me back over here so we can see how that's working. Again, I'll be fair with you, this takes about a minimum of about an hour or so because those beautiful calluses, I'm gonna pull one up. When I started, they were dry. I know they're almost rehydrated. You may get them fresh in the summertime of, you know, I mean, if you're perhaps elsewhere in the US in the South or so, but here in the North, most of the places that sell them will have it dried. And so because they're dry, you're gonna rehydrate them and then they'll cook through. That does take some time. The sugar and the acid breaks that down quickly, but it is a labor of love to really get that beautiful um, chutney done. You also also want to taste. If you're looking for a concentrate, it's gonna be super on the sweeter side, but it should have some acid to the end and some spice. Ooh. That has some spice. So as far as doing, I'm going to grab our fish. Did you have more questions? Are there any questions? Yeah, yes. Brian yeah. is asking, do you usually add the thyme and the garlic at the end of the cooking um, process? Or could you use it earlier to get more flavor? Yeah, you could. Um, I chose to use this method because I different with a quick pan sear. Um, another way I have done this is to blend a wet seasoning. So some folks choose, I did a dry rub today, so I had dried spices. If I was doing a wet, I probably blend like a green seasoning with like onions and garlic and thyme. If you have the thyme that was off, off its stems with a thyme leaf, you could quickly chop those and just have a little bit of like, you know, chopped thyme that could be sprinkled on top. That would be great. If I were to put this in earlier, it'd probably burn quickly and you'd mm -hmm. have like charred, crispy thyme pieces. Um, thyme is so aromatic that when it's in the oil or the fat, it does carry into that um, fish very quickly or very beautifully. If you want some more intense flavor, I'd say definitely go ahead and blend that or chop it and put it in earlier. Just be yeah. mindful of burning in that hot oil while you're searing. Now, Romy, I hope I pronounced this correctly. Is that Romy? Um, is asking what type of vinegar you use in the chutney? Um, it called for white vinegar. I'm going to assume it called for white vinegar. That's the most popular. The white cane vinegar is the most popular in the Caribbean. This was from a chef, a Jamaican chef. Um, I have used balsamic, which is a little bit deeper and has more flavor. It's just all I had. It was fine. But did this, did, this did call for white cane vinegar, which is pretty intense in flavor. It's pretty acidic. Uh, Rami also asked earlier about a substitution. Can you use dry hibiscus petals for the chutney? So this is, uh, this is dry hibiscus flowers. So this is what I was, earlier I was saying that it's called sorrel. And in the culinary world, there are two sorrels. There's sorrel that French is green. It's a green herb that's used to make soups or stews or, sal or salads. And then sorrel or hibiscus or roselle or zugu. Um, we know the names, what are the names folks? Tell us the names, there are more out there. This <laughs> is the hibiscus, the culinary hibiscus. So maybe if you go to a spice shop, they sell it in smaller packets and usually for like tea. That's the exact thing that we have right here. It's called Rosa Jamaica. There's so many names for it, but this is the the hibiscus that we're talking about. So yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. Thank you. The longer, more complicated answer is if you see a green plant that says sorrel, that's a French herb called sorrel, and it's not the same as this hibiscus or sorrel that we're talking about from West Africa in the 15th century is red. There's a bud that comes on the inside. It's grown on a quick branch and then the buds are removed from the middle or plucked from the middle and you have this beautiful like crown um, that's left over. 
Chef, one thing that we didn't ask at the beginning was, yeah. when, when did you become excited about cooking? Oh my God. Um, let me see. I think the f- <laughs> I'm laughing. For those who are not into animals, this might be a little bit harsh. Um, my grandparents, my father, my dad, my mom, the whole family were doing a, like a housewarming and they slaughtered a goat. And I remember watching the process from the goat being slaughtered to the, like, the intestines and then roasting it and making a soup and a stew and curry. And I just was so fascinated that it went from like an animal and then all the pieces were used in various ways. And I was just curious about what do you do with this and why this and why that? That was my first like real memory of like being curious about the backstory of food. I've been around like, you know, rice and beans and macaroni and cheese before. But the first time I really wanted to understand like why and how is when I saw them slaughter a goat and make a full on meal um, for celebration that day. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we are ooh, at time. So we're gonna do two things. I'm gonna get my salad and start assembling my dish. But I'm also gonna grab a dressing in my fridge that I did make earlier with a little bit of sorrel. A little bit of sorrel in it. And I think that would be a great way to kind of like pull our salad together. It's a little bit older. But this is a vinaigrette I made from the sorrel. And so it just has red wine vinegar, um, some of this chutney that was blended in a nutribullet or just a regular blender with some olive oil, a little bit of salt and pepper. So I did somewhat like pull together just a quick, I mean, one of the ways I have to tell folks is that don't be too intimidated about cooking. Like whatever works for you, works for you. This is just literally spring mix, right? If you go to any local farmer, farmer's market, they have spring mix ready and available. Um, I did some red onions, because I think with the flavors of the sorrel, that depth will be beautiful to have that red. Um. And so because my chutney isn't finished just yet, I did want to show that you can then use that same chutney a tiny amount, not add another recipe, perhaps Angela for later on, um, that made a dressing. So it makes it more approachable. So if you are not perhaps... A chutney purse is a lot, right? It's like all the spices. You can reduce that chutney to make a vinaigrette. Um, your basic, like, you know, oil, three parts to one point, oil to oil to acid with some salt and pepper and some chutney in that. So, whew. well, let's make sure that works before we start sprinkling things around here. All right, so I just have my salad here. I'm gonna grab my fish. We're gonna use the one that's a little bit more beautiful, right? That's what they do on TV. They use a beautiful one. They toss the other one on the sink like it never happened. Um, I won't toss this, I'll be eating this. So I have my seared um, fish here. I have my salad. I also did some quinoa, right? Or some grains of any sort. And that was also just really good. My chutney, I'm going to be honest, we still have some time on it, but I do want to show you that it went from dried and now it's definitely rehydrated and now that food's going to start breaking down into that chutney consistency. So we do, you can't hurry food, you can't hurry the love of food, so that keeps going. But the pan seared fish is great for the summertime. We didn't spend much time doing that, right? So it's in the kitchen, out of the kitchen, not too much heat, and it's definitely, I think, a quick meal. This same fish could become a sandwich. This same fish could become a salad or with grains or um, by itself. Can you slightly adjust the camera a little bit? Sure. So you can see the dish. There you go. Thank Beautiful. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so our chutney is still going. And I think we are doing better on time than I imagined. Mm-hmm. So we can actually, yeah. So since we're coming up, any questions from the audience? I know that we've got some chefs and some great cooks out there. So put your questions in the chat. Yeah, if you want, you can come off of mute and you just can just ask them as well. Uh, Romy, and I hope again, I'm not mispronouncing it. I'm asked, have you ever used this recipe with red snapper? 
So red snapper was like my my first love in fish, right? Um, definitely red snapper. I'm gonna tell you the. I mean, for me, red snapper in the north in the northeast is very pricey. Um, so I like to use another lower cost item. Um, but yes, you can use the red. Snapper. I say almost any white fish will take this flavor very beautifully. If you're not a fan of sweet or sweet spicy with that fishy umami flavor then perhaps I'd say, and if you're into like say beef or pork, it also goes well with that. Um, but yes, I would use the red snapper. Yeah. I do think another thing I wanna add about sorrel, I think it's great, um, you know, Thanksgiving, if you're a fan of Thanksgiving, usually a cranberry sauce. I think a, a sorrel chutney is a similar profile. So it has a tart, and that sweetness. So I have swapped out um, cranberry sauce for a sorrel chutney with a turkey. And that goes very beautiful together. Okay. Nice. Very beautiful together. I'd be curious to see if folks have other names or other ways that they have used sorrel. Apart from just drinking hibiscus tea, for example, are there other ways in which folks have used, seen, heard? Yes, have? I have. Yes, I have. Hello. Yes. yes. You're here. Are you hearing? Yes. yes. So guess what? I use the sorrel chutney on my ham at Christmas. So I use it to glaze the ham. I'm dancing over here. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, into the, the traditional honey mustard sauce. You use the sorrel and it gives us a nice glaze and a beautiful flavor. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. I've, I've got one. <laughs> Hi, Chef. Hi, how are you? I've got a story. My grandmother was a real sorrel um, I, maniac. That sounds awful, but I will say she had about five or six different recipes for sorrel. One was when all of us cousins and and I, we used to pretend that we were going to be sick for school, right? We didn't want to go to school, so we'd all start complaining. So my grandmother would make a poultice. She'd take a brown paper bag, lay it on the table, and put a, a, a slice of raw potato in it. She'd have a piece of garlic in it. She'd take some sorrel leaves and sprinkle it on there, and she'd put some vinegar on it. And she'd wrap it up in four, into four, uh, a four by four, and off to bed, she would lay it on our chest, right? <laughs> So in the morning, we, we, you know, some of us had fever, some of us didn't, but we all got the poultice. And in the morning, we would wake up and the, and the potato would be cooked for those of us who had the real fevers. And the potato was uncooked for those of us who were lying about it, right? But all of us had to go to school smelling like garlic and, and raw this and raw that. It was just really interesting. She had another way. She would use sorrel for a drink, like a, a social drink. Yeah. to pour some Barbadian rum in it or some kind of drink in it. She would also use it as a tea if we got sick or just a tea to enjoy with or without honey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Good to see you, Tamika. Good to see you too. So Brian is asking if you could share again where you can purchase sorrel or hibiscus. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not paid for any of this. I just love sharing community resources. <laughs> if you're in Boston, I see the Holy Grail for Latin American, Caribbean, and other Asian, even sometimes Asian, sometimes Asian food is Tropical Market in Roxbury. Um, okay. it's in, in, sorry, in Nubian Square. Huge, right? So much to choose from. They have it dried. Um, most corner like bodegas, some of those have like smaller packets. Um, in Boston, again, I think in the Madapan area, oh my God, I can see the store. It's on Blue Hill Avenue across the street from the where the car wash is, can't remember the name. But if you see a medium to large Caribbean, Latin American, or African grocer, you'll find it. But those who are like North Shore, H or Metro West in Waltham, I find Waltham has tons of, um, we'll say West African stores and they have had sorrel, uh, where else? Yeah, so look for Latin American Caribbean stores and you ask someone, but again, 
be prepared to ask by different names, right? If you say Sarah and nothing comes back, try Rosa Hamaika. If nothing comes back, try Zubu. If nothing comes back, try Roselle. If nothing comes back, I don't know what to tell you. But one of those names will really resonate because again, this is a native plant of West Africa. It came here through enslaved people and New Orleans, for example, the South of America is also a wonderful place for having sorrel. So very many people of African descent will know of sorrel. Um, and folks also of Middle Eastern, I did have sorrel in Qatar. I had sorrel in Qatar. Um, it was called hibiscus tea and it was definitely served there. So Middle Eastern as well may have a connection to this. American Food Basket in Codman Square, Washington Street. They carry a lot of sorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Leone. You're welcome. <laughs> Great club. Uh, Look for Latin American, Caribbean, or African stores, and you will find it in that place. And I offer you a challenge. Have a conversation with the person who's telling you. I ask them about their connection to it. I like, again, my whole spiel is food and storytelling. I loved just now we're hearing like how people use this in their own way. And there's a connection, a heart connection there. So we could go the science route about doing it this way. There's always a heart connection in our community to our local food system and even our global food system as well. Sandra, I'm gonna have you share um, your yeah. holiday spirit with Sorrel and then talk a little bit about um, the uh, Bayesian uh, drink. Using sorrow. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, no, I, I thank you for having me. It's so nice to, to have the opportunity to find another way to use sorrow. I, I've never, I, I'm from Bajan and uh, Panamanian uh, parentage. And so I've never, born in Boston, never um, knew it any other way than a drink. And so it, it was usually the holiday drink that for the, the Christmas season, New Year season, um, with uh, the spirit of rum, as someone else said. Um, but I, I know it particularly with uh, white rum as well, white Jamaican uh, rum. Uh, uh, but also it could be made like a, you know, a, a mule, you know, with, with a, a, a wider spirit of choice. So that's how I, I've known sorrow. Uh, I, I, uh, it, I didn't know chutney. Um, I didn't know that you could uh, eat the, the flower that way. It's a beautiful flower on the island. It's a beautiful, this, that beautiful tropical red flower that many people see. That's what the sorrel is uh, uh, coming from. Um, so, yeah, so I, I appreciate having a new fish recipe. <laughs> to, to and Thank you. Like yeah, thanks for sharing that. I grew up the same way, having sorrel as a holiday drink. It was held just until December. So for two weeks or so, December through January, afterwards it's done. And my dad and my grandparents who farmed, then once you extracted that rich liquid, the, sh the, um, the calluses were tossed and folks started to experiment with that, right? So it's not as intense in flavor, but it still has that fiber content and still be can become a, a product of some sort. So I think as we evolve as folks, we can try on new things. And I think very much if you can use it as a pickle, as a jam, as a chutney, try mm. it on for size. All right, I know we're coming up at time and because bacon is a science is exact and cooking is an art, my sorrel isn't quite ready yet, um, but I do want to extract some liquid so we can at least have a lesson. If you get to this stage of that intense red, right, you're on your way. However, a great way to test is, you see how runny that is? It's still syrupy. What I'm looking for is my, my marker is when I run my spoon through the middle, I should have a clear white line which means it's a syrupy consistency and it separates, right? It's gelatinous, it's jelly enough, it's gooey enough. Right now I'm almost there because it stains so beautifully, but I need to be able to part, pardon the Christian reference, to part the Red Sea and see a clear white line all the way down, which means that all that sugar has been evaporated, all the liquids evaporated, the sugar is working and it's become a beautiful, beautiful, um, sorry. So I can still, Go a little bit longer for comparison. Ooh, see, oh my God, I love science. For comparison, we started here. See how thin that is? And mm. running lights, right? Like super light. And then we're here, intense. So it sticks on the spoon. Oh, we're almost there. We're almost there. Like that. Mm. The back of the spoon. I think mm -hmm. So it's almost there. It just needs some more time. But you're looking for that beautiful, 
like really gooey syrupy consistency another way to test it is you can see it's sticking a little bit and you know that sugar has really started to work and the, the liquid has evaporated so i know we're at time if i'm not done by then at least you have had an idea of where you're going so you're coming from this super runny right that's juice that's juice consistency mm -hmm. right and you're going towards jam towards syrupy and syrupy becomes jam so um almost there but not quite i'm not gonna waste this i'm gonna lick this <laughs> Corinne, you put something in the comp in the chat about cake can you share that so what we're looking for is a sweetness um but my point of reference likes to be a mango chutney but i say you've never had chutney but you had jam so it's sweet but jam's too sweet you need that spice at the end so it's gonna start sweet you're gonna have some acid some tang that hits you in the back of your cheek maybe and then towards the end, a spice will kick in. If it's just sweet and flat, as a jam. A chutney has the sweet, the acid, and that spice in the, and it made a funny sound, a spice in the back there. So that's a taste mm -hmm. you're looking for, like a three, three, fla three layers of flavor. Spice. So Chloe, can sweet. you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you share your comment about using it in a cake? Yes. So I'm also from Jamaica. I don't know if Chef Tamika remembers me. We met in St. Lucia. I remember you so, going through it. Yes, right. So in Jamaica, after you made the drink, after you steep it or boil it for the drink, do not waste what the leaves that you have after that. Use it in a cake as you would a carrot cake. But yeah. instead of using the shredded carrot, use those leaves that you have boiled in the cake and it has a lovely red rich color so we can call it the caribbean red velvet cake and it's also healthier because it's not all that food coloring and it has that same rich dark red color so you can use your take your Ooh. regular carrot cake recipe and substitute the sorrel leaves for it so would you have to puree the uh, the sorrel or chop it finely right so, so you use the one so you're going to make the drink the drink that tamika and our barbadian um member discussed so you, mm -hmm. after you make that for the drink and you strain it out the drink that you're going to add some spirit for for the christmas season or for whenever okay then what is left in the strainer do not discard that that's what goes in the cake ah I yes. love learning. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'll I'll try that. Oh, that's yes, you're welcome. You're yeah. welcome. So well, I have probably a few more minutes, but we are there. We are near there. So as folks can see, it has deepened in color, right? It's like jammy, jelly, sticky. Because I had some raisins in here, some golden raisins. It could be cranberry. The reason we added those was again to add some more texture, add some more sweetness. Um, but definitely I am at my chutney consistency. Again, for comparison, we started here. Oh, we started here, rather. We started here. So full, you know, obviously these are the calluses, the leaves, the buds. And then now we are almost unable to distinguish what's what. Um, this is gonna hurt, but this is, that consistency we're looking for. It sits, it doesn't move much. That definitely burned, that was a bad idea. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and hand back over to the team. Well, before you go, you wanna just talk about your latest adventure with Dutch Pot? Oh, sure, sure, yes, of course. So Food and Folklore has been my, my second baby. I have our actual real baby. Um, about storytelling, you know, playing homage to global traditions. I heard so many being shared just now. And so we have a new venture called Dutch Pot App, which is a space for those in the culinary world, those who are adjacent to food, not quite chefs, not quite home cook, those who dabble, food writers, photographers, have a space to gather in community and have really rich conversation, but most importantly, to streamline and support each other in our businesses. So we're launching that in a few weeks. Um, it's at dutchpot.app. So if folks who are here are in the food space in any way, 
and looking for community and looking for somewhere to belong to, we're building that support system and also some business tools on the back end. Thank you for, that. Also, for that. Yeah. And also, please take a look at the chat, the chat because you need to know that Chef Francis is going to be um, at WBUR on June the 27th at 6.30. She's gonna be moderating a conversation with Jessica B. Harris, um, the author of High on the Hog. Yes, the Netflix series that was out last year that really, really does the most deep dive I've ever seen in, into African and African-American foodways. Um, and tracing our lineage from the continent into America and the Caribbean and elsewhere where African people are. Um, so it's watermelon, it's the yams conversation, it's about you know pork in our culture. Um, it's about all the things that African-American foodways and African foodways have been about. So Dr. B. Harris is like the, the, the patron saint of that work. So I'll be able to chat with her. I'm so honored to do so um, two months from now. You'll also see Chef, Francis um, on June the 20th and the 21st um, at Copley and Davis Square Farmers Markets. So she is busy. You have an opportunity to see her again. And we want to thank her again for making the time to be with us this evening. It's always, it's always wonderful to have her sharing recipes with us. And I also want to add, she does, she does an amazing work with children. She has um, a virtual class that she does with children. I think that's 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 close to her heart. It is. Teach your babies how to cook, man. So thanks for everyone who turned out. Thanks for UFI for the opportunity to share. Again, go out, figure out your food story, find your way. Don't start with perfect. Do what works for you, but make it delicious and make it fun. So we want to thank our sponsors again. Um, we want to thank Bar Foundation, Bromley Charitable Foundation, State Street, John Hancock, Cummings Foundation, the Ajana Fund, and the Janet Tiampo and David Parker Foundation. Um, please join us again. We'll be back um, on June the 28th and Quasi Qua. Um, chef and partner at Comfort Kitchen will be presenting and he'll be I'm going to take a guess. We're not quite sure what he's going to make, but um, I know that he does a lot around African street food. So stay tuned for that. We'll send you information about that. And then on July 19th, we've got Ali Lopez. She's the co-founder of Open Hearth Gatherings, and she's got over 15 years of experience in the food industry, um, cooking, management, and land stewardship. She was originally born in Mexico, raised in Somerville, and she's got a big appreciation for New England seasonality, fires, and tacos. So stay tuned. And there's a registration link on the screen right now, or you can scan. And we will have a fall series as well. So um, in July, we'll have more information about that. You can follow Chef Francis on Instagram. You can go to foodandfolklore.com. Is it org or dot com? Um, dot com, yeah, dot com. Dot com. Um, and you can see her or hear her on the 27th at um, Boston University, um, WBUR, or you can see her at the farmer's markets in Copley and in Davis Square on June 20th and 21st. Are you going to be making anything special, Chef? A red pepper watermelon soup from Marco Samuelson's book called Rise. It's perfect to talk about watermelon in African-American food history during Juneteenth. So we celebrate red foods during that month. So we're reclaiming watermelon. It's been used in some not so fun ways, but we're reclaiming watermelon and making a beautiful red pepper soup with it. Ooh, is there a particular time you'll be preparing that at the markets? I should know this, but I do not. Uh, <laughs> The website will have the details. So the Mass Farmers Market website will have the detail. And Asha, Drew, um, who's from UFI as well, would be there alongside us. So thank you okay. for coming. Hope to see you guys. Have a great summer. And hope you guys have some delicious food this summer. Thanks to thank you so, so much. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, hope to see you again on June 28th. Bye, Kareen. Long time no see. Bye. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Lots of fun.